Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here. I want to talk to you today about how you can heal your adrenals to really avoid and prevent metabolic syndrome. So for starters, let's make sure that we're all clear on what metabolic syndrome is. You know, this used to be called Syndrome X, and you still hear that occasionally. Uh, I did test with Dr. Google. That is the less common term nowadays, but I liked it. It was kind of like X-Files. It was kind of mysterious, <laughs> but metabolic syndrome it is. So here's what it is. It's three of five things that cluster together. And whenever you hear syndrome, that's what it means. It's, it's a pattern. It's not one thing you can point at or measure, but it's a bunch of things that you often see in groups. And usually there's a certain number of elements that have to be together to have it be declared as the syndrome. So the three to five things we think about would be waist circumference, and that's defined differently per male and female, triglyceride levels, HDL levels, blood pressure, and fasting glucose. So when there's a greater waist circumference, higher triglycerides, lower HDL cholesterol, elevated blood pressure, higher fasting blood glucose, three of the five of those, we say that's metabolic syndrome. So why is this important? Well, it's a gateway drug, so to speak, to diabetes. It's an early sign of the body moving towards a diabetic state. And that's a big deal. You know, being diabetic is roughly seven years off the lifespan. You know, seven good years that don't happen. And this right now is the majority of American adults. And I don't mean metabolic syndrome, I mean diabetes or prediabetes. So a more advanced form of that. So arguably 60-70% of American adults have this whole metabolic syndrome thing happening. It's crazy prevalent and it's, it's big and it's reversible, thankfully, that's the good news. So why does this happen? You know, what really gives rise to metabolic syndrome? Well, for some time, researchers have had a cortisol hypothesis. And metabolic syndrome, along with that mid-body weight gain, a few other features show up with that. There's often a loss of skeletal muscle mass. So the extremities, arms and legs, lose a lot of their muscle, and there's more growth of visceral fat. And researchers have known for some time that that same thing happens in Cushing's syndrome and Cushing's syndrome-like diseases. Now, those are conditions of excess cortisol. So you give the body way too much stress hormone and muscles rot and visceral fat grows and blood sugar changes, triglycerides get higher, HDL gets lower, blood sugar creeps up. It's all metabolic syndrome. So they started to think about if it were simply a matter of cortisol excess and that didn't quite fit. There was many examples in which cortisol excess did not explain that. But they became more refined in the recent years. And they looked at not just how much cortisol the adrenal glands make, but how much cortisol the whole body makes and how much is made in the belly fat. Once you take into account whole body cortisol, now you do explain metabolic syndrome and you do have a clear cause of that. So the cycle that goes on is that your adrenals make cortisol but they also make a weaker cousin called cortisone. This is one of many examples about how the body has a lot of checks and balances, and many vital molecules have ways in which they can be regulated before they're produced and also after they're produced. So if you need more cortisol right away than your adrenal glands have made, you can ask them to make more, they will. It'll take them just a little bit, but they will. But even faster than that, you can take some cortisone in circulation, make it into cortisol. Also vice versa. If you've got more cortisol than you need, you can shove some back into cortisone. But there's a cycle where the visceral fat can make more cortisone out of cortisol. And that in turn can cause the visceral fat to grow. And the more there is of it, the more it makes cortisol out of it. So that's this negative vicious cycle. Now how, why would that happen? You know, in what circumstances could that be useful? Well, if you were in a prolonged state of famine, if there was just too little food available and that was not changing in the short term, you would survive better if you could store away as many calories as possible. So stressors give rise to a famine response. And that famine response helped our ancestors who were legitimately in famine. But the drawback is that same response affects us now today in the modern world. And in response to this stress cycle, some of us do have changes in our appetite, you know, and, and they can be subtle. It may be just a few bites or 
half of an extra serving or just, just a little bit more as long as it's there. You know, it may not be much and it's not conscious and it's often even not at the level of deliberate control. But there's others of us to where even if we're not consuming extra, we're still more in the storage state. And then the last thing that goes along with this is that even apart from how much we eat and what we do with it, it changes our food preferences. You know, if you're, if you're stressed out and you're frazzled, say you came back from being lost in the woods for a week and you're famished, your body's in, it's in famine state and you're very stressed, your fear of survival, you know, you're offered a cheeseburger or you're offered a salad. <laughs> Most of us are going to want some solid food with sustenance. We want some heavy, dense calories. That burger is going to go down really fast. <laughs> but the salad, eh, maybe we'll get back to that because that's, it's wonderful food, but it's not caloric density. And we crave caloric density when we're in a state of stress. You know, in fact, a study was done in which they, they put people, they induced stress by having people take these math tests. And they were done in two ways. So one group was given really mean people who push them and give them hard tests that were very much beyond their skills. And the other group was given nice people, comfortable settings, easy questions, take your time, no rush, you're doing fine. And the other group had a very different, very harsh experience. So the real purpose was to see how stress would impact appetite and food choices. So after the test was over, they turned everyone loose to a buffet. And as is done in studies like this, they very carefully monitored, uh, and they had sensors, so whatever you took from the buffet, they knew how many pounds of what there was. And the servers were also trained to where when they're clearing your plate, they would measure how much you did, how much leftovers you had, if any. And with all that, they knew exactly what these people chose and how much of it they ate. And the differences were shocking. The group with the mean testers, they ate a lot of chocolate cake. <laughs> The other group, they had more broccoli, more vegetables, but it was a clear distinction. And that's the cycle that we go under, is that our food choices change when we've got this heightened stress load. So the cycle is that stressors drive us to produce more cortisol. We go into a storage state. That storage state takes more of our fuel and takes it away from where we can use it, away from our bloodstream, and it stores it in the visceral fat. So our fuel gets stored and our blood sugar drops. When the blood sugar drops, guess what, we want more food because we're hypoglycemic, we're hungry. And that in turn makes more fat storage, the sugar's taken away, we're more tired, and when we're tired and frazzled, whatever external life thing is thrown at us we've got to deal with, it's that much harder. So our stress load goes up. And guess what, that's what started this whole dang cycle. So now it's perpetuating and it's worsening and our mood tanks because of it. So how do we heal all this? How do we get out of it? <laughs> Well, you know, the big needle movers are always changing the things we can change. And honestly, your immediate relationships, your immediate work situations, your big life aspirations, I cannot overstate the importance of those. You know, I've had many people to where one gal, I remember, she always had this chronic cortisol elevation and she was a competitive triathlete. I really thought that that was the issue, that it was her her overtraining that was driving it up and keeping it up. And she would do a lot of good things. She would take the right supplements. She would, you know, eat well and eat clean and it wouldn't budge. And I kept saying, it's the overtraining. Well, she then talked about how she was on an erratic schedule with work. She was a shift nurse. You know, she would work these rotating shifts. And I thought, oh, Eureka, this is it. You know, I wrote her a note saying, hey, she must not work like this. This is not medically okay for her. She must be on a set, solid schedule. And she got a little bit better. Not as much as I was hoping for. Like, oh, huh, it was still stuck. And I was frustrated. And she even lowered her training and it didn't help that much. Well, many months later, she had a change moving away from working on the floor into a good managerial role. Not all those are good, but she was in one in which she had a lot of latitude over her department. She had good coworkers. She was in a happy, conducive environment. She didn't really communicate this to me. And honestly, I could have done a better job asking and finding out, but she was not in a good workplace before. She was frazzled and she was pushed too hard and she had more responsibilities than she could really take care of. And not because of her skill set, but because of just her time availability. And so she was always frazzled from that. 
So this shift from work, and here's the funny thing. So she, she comes back in and she's back to competing in triathlons and her cortisol is better than ever. And I said, wow, wonderful, I'm happy for you, but help me understand what's happened here. Because still I'm thinking the overtraining was a big part of it. So she goes, oh yeah, I moved from this awful situation I had before to a better managerial role and I feel so much better from it. It's like, wow, okay, so that's big. So, so please do all the right things for your health, uh, but your main situations in life, who you're with you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is funny, I thought about this too. You know, when we're very little, it's just our parents that we're with and that matter, not much else. We get a little bit bigger, then it starts becoming our friends, you know, our classmates, our playmates, and our chosen friends when we're older, like adolescent and young adults, those that we choose to spend time with. They're, they're our whole world. And then past that, our coworkers become very significant. There are people we spend a lot of our waking time with. So think about who you're around. And I'm not one to say, you know, you've got to ditch this spot and go over here. There's not really a perfect scenario. It's always who we are and how we communicate. So there are times where it's appropriate to vote with your feet and move, move out of a relationship to a better one. That's real. But more often than not, I would argue, it's a matter of how we're expressing our needs and how we're really hearing their needs. You know, I realized there was a, a man that I saw for years who had very severe depression and he was a curious case per many of his physicians. You know, he would try any number of treatments and talk therapy. He did uh, electroconvulsive therapy. He did magnetic resonance therapy. He's trying all these things that are less common, more extreme, that would often help the hardest of the hard and they would not help him. But through it all, he was a very easy person to interact with. He was extremely polite and cordial and thankful and uh, considerate in, in his interactions with, with his providers and yet he was suffering. And I realized just recently, I wish I would pick this up sooner, how weird that was. You know, kudos to him, nice man, wonderful, but how atypical that is. You know, most who are suffering, who are not feeling well in some way, who are depressed or anxious or in a bad state themselves, they are not going to be nice people. And all too often, we will interact with them and think, oh wow, they're being a jerk to me. You know, they're not respecting me. They're being mean to me. And in reality, they're acting out on their own, their own suffering, their own pain. And we internalize that and we personalize that. So just know that if there is someone who's really that thorn in your side, they're probably suffering and it's probably not really about you. It's about them and their, their story that's not really been cared for in some way. So if nothing else, even just shifting how you feel, how you perceive that slight may change things dramatically for you. So, you know, I had on my agenda to talk about resistant starch and light and adaptogens and carb cycling, they're real, do them. <laughs> and at the same time, if there's big needles you need to move in your life, do that first. Put the energy into that because that will give you the biggest traction in healing the adrenals and reversing metabolic syndrome. <laughs> Dr. Alan Christensen here. Take great care of yourself. We'll talk in really soon.